safety, uh, police, sheriff, emergency management. We also do some public safety, uh, utilities, other stuff. Uh, that's not terribly pertinent other than why the problem has come up that we're trying to move to a serverless system from a traditional setup. So, a little more details. So, we currently have, um, I don't know the exact number, over 200. So, that'd be, you know, 400 plus whatever, counting iOS and Android apps. Um, salespeople tell me we're in 43 states and Canada. And I uh, pulled it up last week just out of curiosity because I knew it was getting pretty high. Active sessions per week, so about a little over 2 million right now for kind of across our whole uh, grouping. So what we're seeing is a huge spike in demand for our infrastructure, and there's one over guy over there that's with me and another one who couldn't make it this week. <laughs> and so all it's up to the three of us to handle it all, so it's a, a little bit outpacing our capabilities to keep up with the traditional infrastructure. Um, so this is kind of a look at our current Lambda executions, which is only a small fraction of what we actually have moved over. Most of it's still on our traditional stack. Um, so, you know, we're hitting spikes right now in the 4,000 concurrency, getting up higher. Um, the biggest problem with our particular activity is when people send push notifications, huge spikes of instantaneous data connections coming in, and then it just dies. So you can kind of see the spikiness of our load. Well, part of our problem is looking at sort of a traditional approach to that would be, oh, auto-scaling. Well, auto scaling's too slow for that. Our spikes are over in 20, 30 seconds tops. Well, hey, now we have our new load, so it's not terribly helpful. And uh, we can't really afford to just have the infrastructure sitting there to handle those spikes and then be idle for hours and hours on end. So, uh, before getting into the serverless part, I um, just want to talk about, we did originally think, hey, we'll move to containers, and that, uh, you know, a container cluster, hopefully that will help, spins up a lot faster. Um, problem we kind of decided against doing that was, still small team, we've got to manage the containers now. We're not really getting away from our root problem of man hours trying to keep all this going. The container cluster itself can auto scale, but again, it's pretty slow to get moving. So, the original thought of doing that kind of, well, maybe that's not going to work for us. Um, and that was kind of when uh, Amazon was starting to push their serverless application model real heavily. So, we started looking at that. Um, so, that is the solution that we've come up with. And these are kind of a lot of the technologies that are specific to AWS, which we use, but uh, I know Google Cloud Compute and Azure have competing versions of most of this, so uh, it's probably possible to go take the general stack to wherever you're interested in being. Uh, so, the, really the major ones, API Gateway and Lambda, so you can run code without servers, without, you know, limits on concurrency. Uh, DynamoDB is nice scaling DB, but obviously there's a lot of options there. Um, our previous one was on Mongo, it was handled by Atlas, works great. Um, you can use RDS or any of those managed database systems. Um, Web-wise, we went with React because it is very easy to turn that into a flat file system that you can host on S3 as a website. So again, trying to keep everything as scalable as possible, CloudFront. Worldwide endpoints, um, and then the actual, you know, the infrastructure as code part. We're using CloudFormation, um, SAM templates, same thing, just an extension on it. And we're also looking and using a little bit of the serverless framework, which is uh, um, interesting in that you can blend clouds with those uh, configurations if you're interested in trying to diversify your cloud. So this is sort of a really basic look at that uh, infrastructure in action. This, this piece right here is our traditional web stack. Um, simplified, of course, it's a lot more horizontal than that, but you know, it's a load balancer, web server, load balancer, processing, file system, 
database. Just as plain and simple as you can get where now we're looking at this where you know we've got some kinesis streams coming in to help gather batch information. Lambda is really the workhorse center of everything and then all the auxiliary services there from that list uh, providing file storage, object storage really. Um, Redis caching, speed things along. Uh, we use SNS for a lot of our push notifications are all SNS based for our apps. SES to send all you know emails to all of our uh, our clients specifically, not their end users. So right now, no, um, but part of us wanting to go to this is we do have some clients that are kind of government based and want to say, hey, we want it in our gov cloud. So having this all as code, we could just say, yeah, go. Give us an account with the access we need and bam, we'll have this whole thing set up for you just for your app. A lot of people want that for their accounting. Um, most of our clients don't care though, so they just end up in our infrastructure and it's fine. Um, so, just a little bit of how we've seen, um, we're not super far along in our process yet, we're just getting started, so this is kind of what we've felt like, some pros and cons. Um, so the serverless framework, uh, from my experience thus far, seems pretty good on a complex project. They have a lot of nice syntactic sugar to help you organize your project, a little bit nicer than CloudFormation does. Um, Multiple cloud providers, if that's, uh, you know, you want to spread that surface risk out and uh, that makes that super easy. Um, pretty standard, you can deploy it yourself, you can put it in a pipeline. Um, if you've never seen seed.run, that's their own product that does their pipelines for serverless deployments. It's pretty slick. We don't use it at work. I use it personally and it does a great job. It's free personal use, so hard to complain. And uh, they have some pretty great documentation, tutorials, get you rolling on it. Um, from a downside, it does abstract a lot, so there could be some problems for you there. I was stretching a little bit. There's not a lot of downsides that I've found so far. Uh, and it's probably overkill for smaller projects. Um, we do, a lot of our work is ingesting data from our clients and trying to put it more in a format that our apps are used to displaying. So. We have a lot of little things that are just processing data and doing a full serverless project's pretty overkill. So most of those for us are just gonna be a cloud formation. Um, so like I said, it does have some limitations. Uh, cloud formation slash SAM on complex projects, typically without, yeah, go ahead. Serverless application model. It's literally just an extension of cloud formation that adds some of the serverless stuff into it to make it a little bit easier. Um, so you can just think of them as the same thing. Um, the limitations there is traditionally, uh, without this thing called CFN include, a CloudFormation template has to be one file, so those things can get big in a hurry, um, defining out all of your IM, IM policies and everything else. Uh, so that is a definite downside to just straight CloudFormation. It is specific to AWS. Um, <coughs> if that's your cloud, then it works great. Uh, deployment via AWS CLI or pipelines, you can you know, put that into a code pipeline with code commit and it works great. We are uh, doing that on several of ours now. Um, so the downside I already talked about with uh, the simplicity of one file. Um, so uh, documentation I have found to be a little bit more difficult on cloud formation as well uh, than serverless. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, so this is, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about why we're doing it this way with this uh, particular one. So uh, all of our Florida sheriffs, of which we have quite a few, want their sex offenders listed in the uh, app in a map. It's pretty cool. You can see your pin and kind of you know see if there's a reason for you to be worried in your area. Um, but the way the Florida law department provides that is a CSV file for each county and you can only pull one per five minutes 
which is kind of tedious. I don't know why they do that. Personally, I think that's crazy, but that's the way they do it. So what we have to do is have a whole slew of these suckers running every so often so that we can pull them down and get them updated for each day. Um, building this in a single cloud formation template would be pretty terrible. It would be huge, and adding a new one's kind of a cluster, trying to figure out where to put it. So what we did was we used the CFN include that I mentioned earlier. It's a library you can use for free. And what that does is just give you those include statements. Um, so you can organize your product. And uh, so we have these in functions. There's an example function. So next time somebody has to add one, copy, paste, make the appropriate adjustments. Um, and that just kind of looks like this. So this is a standard Lambda function defined in cloud formation. Um, you provide it your handler. You get a role, which so you can see the get attribute. This is a role we defined in another file here. So you, you don't have to actually put the names of those. You can just say, hey, based on this role name that I already defined in my cloud formation, fetch that ARN and stick it in here for me. You know, your runtime, memory, timeouts, auto-publish, because we want to do that, and running on a schedule. And then this is our kind of environment variable stuff that we have to change for the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, so the, the benefit for us here is, hey, we get a new county, copy, paste, to run two deploy commands. It's up and running. We don't even have to concern ourselves with it. So it's just up into all of the one giant file. Yeah. Yeah, so each, so each county gets one of these little blocks as a separate YAML file, and then you just put it in that include statement set in the first, the base as we would call it. And then you run CFN include on base, it knows all those and sucks them all in, and just in the background it's producing that one monolithic file for you so you're not having to manage it. Um, so if you are gonna use these, that is a great way to organize your project a little bit better and not have quite so much uh, gigantic searching because it can get pretty tedious. Um, so we're going to jump off to the serverless uh, one is a little bit too big to just uh, pop up in a slide I felt like. so. And this is Absolutely just their tutorial. Um, if you go to, I got the, I'll pull it back up, serverless-stack.com. They have a great tutorial on setting up a note-taking app, of course. Um, but it goes through the process of building an API independently, the front end independently. And really, you can learn a ton about all of this setup um, from doing that. And this is basically the serverless YAML file for the um, API that you end up with at the end of it. Um, so similar, but obviously a little bit different. You get some really nice little uh, things like if you want to do staging, so a dev and prod, serverless makes that really simple. Um, you can just put in some of these stage variables, and when you deploy, you define a stage, it shoots it out there. Um, and when you're defining your actual um, let's see. So the functions, you'll notice they don't get named. Uh, your tables don't get named. Everything is automatically named. But it's, uh, it's you know just a random string that gets appended. And then serverless, much like in cloud formation, will allow you to just pop those in there. So when you're doing your uh, your naming, you can put in this is for whatever. It will append that, and then your dev and your prod stages won't clobber each other. Um, so that, that's pretty important there. But it's pretty easy to read. Um, here you can see this one saying this one's on AWS. So you can have multiple providers. So you can define it all up as one giant application if you'd like. Um, you can set the environment variables, uh, define a role. So here it's just saying it's going to have access to the Dynamo table that we're uh, building up. And here is just you know your standard kind of functions to do a note-taking app. And then, much like doing CFN include, this has a little bit cleaner syntax of including extra files where 
hey, I'm going to include my table as a separate file, my S3 bucket, Cognito user pool. Um, you can do all of this in CloudFormation as well. It's just a little bit less clean. So this is where I'd say for large projects, serverless for us has provided a little bit more value and being um, easier to handle. Yeah, so there you go, so serverless-stack.com. Um, and like I said earlier, a few slides back, seed.run is kind of their product based on that from a pipeline perspective. It's super easy to put it in any pipeline you want, though, because you just install the serverless uh, CLI tool and go to town on it. Well, that was a little bit faster than I didn't expect it to be. Um, so, yeah, any questions? Did you, uh, did you look at any of the other offerings, or what pushed you to the end goal? Uh, we were already fully on AWS before we even got started on this, so it was just natural to us where we were going to go. Have you looked at things like OpenFi or anything like that? Like the open functions that they No, we have not. Um, I would give that a whirl, though. Yeah, absolutely. You had questions. So, a client sending a push notification. Okay. So, when it lands, there's calls back to let it, you know, the analytic calls back. When they actually tap on it, it pulls a history of notifications and other parts of the app in. So, somebody says, Yeah, I got to send one out right now. Bam, it lands. We see this huge spike, and then it trails off very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we did it terribly when we first set it up as far as like a VPC concern and setting up our users and everything um, and had to come back and just completely gut it and try again. <laughs> um, there are a lot of great tools now that will help you on that as far as like, oh, this is a great template for a standard VPC. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it off the top of my head, but they literally have a... Hmm? Yeah, and they actually have a tool now um, that will do some validations and gets your setup and tell you if you're kind of under best practices. Um, I don't remember if it's... Yeah, yeah, just deploy, deploy them. So I, I would recommend looking at that tool that's from Amazon directly so when you kind of set it up, you can set it up on what you think is the best practices based on stuff or deploy it and then you can actually run that and say, oh yeah, it fits or maybe this is out of spec. Um, to answer your portion, um, we haven't had any issues with Amazon thus far. Um, it's worked great. Uh, we did actually, it was kind of, it's been a while now, but we hit their limit on mobile analytics. I think it was like 120 apps or something and we couldn't add any more. Um, so we let them know because they didn't actually have a way to increase that quota and it was about a two week turnaround I think and they had it built in where you can now do it. So. They do. Um, one, if you are looking at the service, I'll go ahead and tell you the base Lambda limit is a thousand concurrency. You can increase that, but they will ask you to justify it because they have to preload resources into the region to make sure they have your load capacity. Uh, so, you know, they'll ask you to go to your Lambda where you can see that you're getting uh, throttled because of your limit and you can show that and what you're expecting and I mean, that's all we had to do, and they were happy to bump it, so. So outside of this push spike, just what kind of, is it the high performing app and the kind of things that people are on mobile phones, are you trying to target any sort of PCS? Yeah, it's just people looking at it most of the time. Um, honestly, our biggest features are who's in jail, the most wanted, and who got arrested. <laughs> so that's what people apparently want to look at, so. Uh, that that's pretty it, it, 
you know, it varies a lot, you know, widely throughout the day. So, um, yeah, well, and it's just not, there's not a lot of demand at a given time. There would be, I think, if like a high profile person was going to show up. Yeah. So that's our biggest problem is most of our demand is highly unpredictable. So beyond some major machine learning, we, <laughs> we're not going to do a good job of that. I think. Uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, in our current one, if you are poor number 10,001, you get shoved in the queue and a ton of people come in right behind you and you're all in the queue and, um, you know, it might be four or five seconds before that kind of clears itself uh, on a big, in the worst case scenario, a couple of our apps all send one simultaneously and there's, you know, 30,000, 40,000 coming in and they all get backlogged. Well. Um, you know, right now we have our concurrency set at 10,000. I expect I'm going to have to have that come up as we start migrating apps really fully onto this system, and we'll ideally have 40 or 50,000 as a concurrency so that there won't be any weight on those folks. And that's kind of the best part about the way they're setting up Lambda is, hey, if you can justify the need for that, they're going to give it to you. And then, so we won't have weight, ideally, of course. Um, if you're using any of their libraries to handle API gateway work. Uh, actual SDKs, which eh, shoddy a little bit on the mobile side, I'll tell you. Um, Amplify is fantastic, though. Uh, we've had a ton of luck with that, and it will handle a lot of the retry mechanics. So you may have some folks who just get bumped one uh, retry cycle, but um, ideally, I think most of our uh, Push history lambda is running at about two or three hundred milliseconds as a response time, and it's gonna. I I feel like gonna be great at serving that need. What, what is it on the current stack? Um, well, if you're the lucky first group, it's yeah. pretty much the same. If you're not, then you're gonna be four or five seconds out. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, um, and a lot of that's making sure you scale your lambdas resources appropriately. Um, obviously, if you just give it the base, it might work, it might not. So a lot of that we've found trial and error um, because they do only allow you to change the memory on Lambda. The CPU scale is kind of in the background in a way that they, they don't tell you. Um, so you can run it, you know, run your test against it and kind of see, oh, my sweet spot is a gig or whatever. Um, because I think when we first did it, we tried 512. Uh, we were seeing six, seven hundred milliseconds. Like, eh, okay, we'll bump it up one, and then bam, it was right back where we were expecting. So we were a little CPU throttled on that lower one. So more of a, an infrastructure boom than a performance boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that that can be difficult. Um, the concurrency limit is kind of your biggest. Hey, we're willing to, you know handle this. Um, the biggest thing that we found anyway on Amazon is uh, I think maybe now you could actually probably get AWS billing to do these, but at the time it was pretty nitpicky to get it set up, so we use Cloud Checker and just we have limits set where we get dinged anytime we're surpassing some normal expectations of utilization, so we can go in there and, okay. So you can do that too on API Gateway. Um, so on a per app basis, our setup is going to have a rate limit per app, allow you know the customer to up that if they feel so inclined to keep backups from happening. Yeah, at least a little bit. Um, you know, it's one of those where if people are using it so much and they're really in, enjoying the utilization, we'll figure out what we got to do. But we keep an eye on the actual expenditure. We do have the rate limits set uh, both on Lambda itself and individual app level on API Gateway. Yeah. 
Uh, so a lot of that is serverless framework helps there because you could easily just swap that over to say Google Compute. Um, they've got their, I don't remember what they call their functions product, but they have the exact same thing, so does Azure, yeah. So they all kind of have most of those same products. Uh, there's a little bit of a, it's gonna be a pain in the butt because we're using Dynamo now and we gotta get that out and move it, but. Uh, um, Yes, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, there's there's a couple of them that have a, a similar concept to the you know the snippet of code running. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, it, it is, and it, it's a little, um, it's a little bit of a black box, but not completely. Um, so they fire up sort of how many error containers they feel like they need to handle your load, and we'll keep doing so. They fire up really fast, um, but there is the concept of a cold start. So uh, if you don't have something utilizing a Lambda for, I think it's 10 minutes, give or take, it'll be two or three seconds to fire up. Um, there are some products to help you out there that are, uh, will quote, warm your lambdas continuously so that there's always one ready to go. Um, we, we, we figure just based on our utilization from looking at our current system, we probably won't have that problem because most of our routes are being hit pretty routinely even if it's not a high volume. But uh, I've, I've definitely looked at that as uh, something we may need to do. Yeah, well, that was kind of what I harped on. We're having to manage that now, and it's yeah, just okay. trying not to manage more machines, more containers. Well, yeah, that's our biggest problem is we have less people time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Easy to do instances. Um, it should be cheaper uh, based on just our initial, uh, we, I don't remember, I think it's called Cloudcraft, maybe it allows you to make those nice little diagrams, but one of the more interesting tools is if you make the diagram, it will sum up the cost based on, you can put in parameters of utilization, which is pretty handy, so.
Check one, two, test.